A few moments ago, Buckingham Palace announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Many of us were deeply saddened by the news of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II passing on Thursday the 8th of September 2022. My name's Ashley Hilton, I'm a dual qualified doctor and dentist, and in this video I'm going to talk about the Queen, her health, her impact on the healthcare system during her reign, and why she actually died when she did. As we know, Queen Elizabeth II was born in 1926, when at the time the average life expectancy for a baby girl born then was 62 years old. And as previously stated, she died on the 8th of September 1922 at the ripe old age of 96. So during the Queen's lifetime, the average life expectancy for a baby girl born in England has gone from 62 all the way up by 21 years to 83, which is really impressive. Also, what's incredibly impressive is that the Queen outlived her life expectancy of 62 at that time by a stunning 34 years. Now, for reference regarding what we're about to discuss, it's worth remembering that she came into power at 1952, exactly 70 years ago, at the age of 26. And there have been a lot of changes in the healthcare system in that time that helped her live to the age that she did. So before we dive in. If you're interested in healthcare and are maybe thinking about applying to become a doctor in the UK, you might want to check out this video or the rest of the channel where I talk through the process of applying to medicine in the UK and give you the best resources to help you get there. Also, if you want more videos on healthcare subjects and just the things that are coming up, you might want to subscribe to the channel where I bring out weekly videos to keep you up to date. So one of the first developments that occurred during the Queen's lifetime that will have helped increase her health and lifespan is the advent of vaccines. It wasn't until well into the 20th century that vaccines first became available and the first really effective vaccine was in 1945 against influenza. In 1954, an American physician called Jonas Salk first produced the polio vaccine. And then in 1960, a virologist called Albert Sabin then developed that into an oral polio vaccine, which then became a lot more widespread. In the 1950s, there was a lot of concern. People were refusing to have the vaccine. Now, the Queen actually played a big role in people accepting this vaccine. Queen Elizabeth II had Anne and Charles vaccinated against smallpox when the virus was rolled out in Britain in the 1950s. Details of Prince Charles and Princess Anne vaccinations were given to the press in 1957, the Daily Mail then ran a story on January the 23rd under the headline, The Queen Decides on Polio. The significance of the Queen's support of the polio vaccine again became relevant in the early 2000s, where concerns over the safety of the MMR triple vaccine and its possible links to autism and bowel disease led to record low levels of children being given the vaccine, creating fears of a measles epidemic. Of course, a lot of the fears at the time were around Andrew Wakefield's falsified data that he produced in his study that was a landmark and created this whole uproar about the MMR vaccine, which was totally false. However, the Queen did help with this. And actually, the Queen's support of the vaccines was used in Parliament to assure the public that the MMR vaccine was in fact safe. The second area that the Queen had a big impact on during her time was that of antibiotics. In 1928, two years after Queen Elizabeth II's birth, Alexander Fleming actually went on holiday and and left a petri dish in his lab. Now, when he came back, it had grown some mold and he realized there that the mold was actually fighting off the bacteria. He then noticed the inhibitory action of the stray mold of a plate of culture of Staphylococcus bacteria in his laboratory in St. Mary's Hospital in London. The mold was a strain of something called Penicillium P. notatum, which gave its name to the now famous widely used drug penicillin. This then enabled penicillin to be used to treat infections on the front line of World War II by 1944. Then during the 1950s, antibiotic research provided a steady stream of new antibiotic variants that covered a wide range of bacterial infections. Following that, the Queen Elizabeth Jubilee Diamond Trust then funded something called the Tracheoma Initiative. Now this was a program that provided nearly 27 million antibiotic eye treatments and over 100,000 sight-saving operations just from this program alone. This initiative drastically reduced the incidence of trachoma and other bacterial eye diseases across seven countries, just further highlighting the impact of the Samaritan charity work that Queen Elizabeth II undertook. Another area of healthcare in which Queen Elizabeth II had a large impact was that of HIV and AIDS. Now, as we know, the first case of HIV was detected in Africa in the 1970s, but by the 1980s, it had a widespread and devastating effect on the Western Hemisphere. The Queen was dedicated to ending AIDS, also to ending the stigma associated at the 
time with people living with HIV. In 2007, Her Royal Majesty visited Uganda and some hospitals as well as families living with HIV. Now this helped to challenge the stigma, but also affirmed the right and the dignity of the people living with HIV. And actually the Queen's presence there helped strengthen the HIV response in line with the agenda of the Commonwealth. And whilst there's no widely accessible cure for HIV and AIDS today, antivirals and widespread education on protecting sex and transmittance have led to a 35% reduction in HIV diagnoses in England from around 2014 to 2019. In 2019, an estimated 94% of people living with HIV have been diagnosed, 98% of those diagnosed were on treatment, and 97% of those on treatment having an undetectable viral load, meaning they cannot pass on the infection. Now, another area in more recent memory is that of how the Queen responded to COVID. The COVID pandemic was first recognized in Wuhan, China, December 2019, with COVID-19 quickly spreading affecting people across the world. The UK went into lockdown for the first time on the 23rd of March 2021 with social contact limited to your own household. Queen Elizabeth II provided support and comfort to those isolating during her 2020 Christmas speech, saying for those feeling sad and alone at the time were in her thoughts and prayers. In January 2021, the 155 bed Queen Elizabeth unit was opened at the Royal London Hospital built within five weeks to meet the demand for the treating COVID patients. The Queen spoke to and congratulated construction workers and staff for such a great achievement. And as you know, at the time, the race was on to produce a vaccine that was going to curtail the number of hospitalizations and the rising number of deaths. Once again, to encourage her support for vaccinations, the Queen announced publicly that her and Prince Philip had decided to have the vaccination in January of 2021 at Windsor Castle. One area it would be remiss of me to not talk about is the Queen's impact on the NHS. So the NHS was founded on the 5th of July, 1948. The guiding principle being that services would be funded predominantly by taxes, meaning that there would be no pay at the point of care, services would be distributed evenly and fairly, and that it would be assessed by the need of the patient rather than their ability to pay. Before the NHS, across the Queen's early life, a panel system was in place where all the working men would choose a GP from a panel of working doctors. Whilst this did make a considerable difference to the large portion of the poor entitling them to free government funded healthcare, this system did not provide the healthcare cover to the men's family members or their dependents. The NHS has undergone multiple reforms since its genesis, such as the creation of the modern dependable NHS in 1997, hailing to the introduction of primary care groups to abolish inequalities between GP practices. All of this which has obviously been backed by the Queen on various occasions in her Christmas speeches and various public outgoings where she has talked and revered of the staff and all the services available and provided by the NHS. So although the contributions of Queen Elizabeth II during her reign are too numerous to name and vast and widespread, I hope that this video has maybe enlightened you to a few areas within healthcare that you may not have known of the impact that she had. As you can see, many of these vaccination programs, changes to our healthcare system and antibiotics have all made a massive contribution to the life expectancy of people and led to the Queen being as healthy healthy as she is and being able to live to such a ripe old age. If you want to find out more about healthcare, maybe a little bit about the NHS, or maybe what's it like to be a doctor versus a dentist, maybe check out this video here. But I'd like to thank you for watching and I will see you over in one of those videos.